Kaikeyi, Chapter 6 As Mantra had intended all along, my practice sessions with her changed me. Once I learned how to use the information gathered around the palace, I wished to do it. Over the years, trips to the kitchen to steal a snack became hours-long visits. I would mention to the head cook, I believe my father intends to host a wedding at the palace next month. We have not been told yet, he said. He was a tall, willowy man who was unfailingly kind to everyone working below him. I wondered how he managed to still run such a competent kitchen. I know, I just heard it from Devi Mega. Despite my long ago evasion of her sewing lessons, my old tutor had warmed to me over time. I wanted to tell you first to be sure you had enough notice. Whose wedding? he asked. The chief of Singapore's son is to marry Devi Mega's niece. The marriage had been arranged over 10 years ago when the son was still quite young, but the chief had recently begun making noise that he was unhappy with his grant of land and wanted more. My father had offered him a great celebration in the capital to avoid conflict breaking out. The kingdom was constantly engaged in a balancing act, keeping the men who governed its towns and villages happy without allowing them to come into dispute with one another. Of course, I did not say any of this to the cook. I do not know how many people will be in attendance, but I believe it will be an outdoor celebration, monsoons willing. I came back the next week bearing information from Megha. Her niece prefers milk sweets, I said, and the chief has a sensitive stomach. The cook frowned. I can prepare a separate dish for him. The point of this wedding was to soothe the chief's ambitions. It seemed to me that... Singling him out would make him feel weak, embarrassed. Perhaps it might be easiest to prepare all the dishes with milder spices instead. He clucked his tongue. A bland dinner will be savoured by no one. I found the grass-green bond between us, gave it a soothing touch. You can do this, I encouraged him. Out loud, I said, I believe it will be a challenge, but you have never failed to impress before. His expression became thoughtful. I suppose I could. Do you know if he's simply sensitive to chilli heat or other foods as well? What about oil? I will find out for you, I said, giving him a sunny smile and watching our bond grow stronger before my eyes. Over those same several weeks, I began readying the guest wing of the palace for heavy use. I took a survey of the rooms with Mantra and another servant, Shilpa. The palace's dark stone structure with its high windows and narrow corridors did not seem restrictive to me, but I had heard that to some the rooms felt chilly and unfriendly. And so with my father's complete ignorance of my activities at my disposal, I set about writing it. Despite their occasional usage, some of the furniture and linens had not been changed in years and so I spoke to the head tailor requesting brighter lighter materials to soften the stone rooms and make them just slightly more hospitable. I also met with our most skilled weaver commissioning a fine tapestry for the wall bearing out my prediction to Mega that I would not need such sewing skills myself. It arrived the night before the chief and I supervised its hanging myself. The next morning, I made sure to present at the chief's arrival, meeting him and accompanying him about his journey on the freshly maintained roads connecting Singapore to Kekaya. And the chief was more than happy to oblige, extolling the quality of the work. When we stopped outside his door, he paused to admire the tapestry. The work is lovely. I believe I have seen the spiral pattern work on the Temple of Brahma in the forest near Singapore. Thank you, I said, ducking my head so as to appear modest. The weavers of the city are known for this particular pattern. You are a very poised young woman, he said when I took my leave. Your father must be very proud. That little shard of praise wrapped itself around my heart, but not as much as what happened at dinner the next evening. I had just carefully sopped up some curry with a small piece of roti. It was mild, as the cook had promised, but nutty and fragrant with cardamom, the mutton melting like butter on my tongue. Next to me, Yutajit made a happy noise. The cook has done so well, he said. It's not very spicy, is it? But you hardly notice. 
I said nothing, my gaze flicking up to the high table where my father sat next to the chief. The chief was gesturing to his plate and my father's eyes connected with mine. He gave me a small smile, so small, I would have thought it was an accident, except he followed it with a brief nod. My stomach fluttered with happiness and I looked down at my plate. I knew logically that he would go back to ignoring me soon enough, but there would be no words of praise for my machinations, but I could not help my happiness. After a week of wedding ceremonies and celebrations, the palace went back to normal. I had missed my usually usual weekly lesson with Yutajit, but that was more common occurrence than I would have liked. It had been almost three years since we started training together and in those years we had less and less time to take short trips to the cellars. We both had acquired real responsibilities. Though I had still managed to work my way through every scroll I could hunt down involving magic and meditation. I slipped down there every so often and wound my way through the shelves wondering what to read now that I exhausted all the magic scrolls. I found myself drawn to the shelf that housed recent stories and histories and my eyes instantly alighted on one scroll at the top of the pile with a distinctive border of red wines on the outside. I remembered my mother's slender fingers unrolling it for she had read it many times. I opened the scroll eager for the small scrap of connection and found at the very top a short note. My breath caught. My dear Karkei, I do not have much time to write this. I hope that when you find it, you will also find it in your heart to forgive me. I do not wish to leave any of you, but especially not you. For being a Yuvradni is no easy task, but I know you are strong, Karkei. Be careful. Remember the lessons of these scrolls. I know you'll thrive. There was no signature, but I did not need one to recognize my mother's elegant hand. I dashed a hand across my eyes so my tears would not fall on the scroll. For years now I had thought she had left me without saying goodbye. But she had thought of me, believed in me, told me things she had never said aloud. After a few moments, I turned my attention to the rest of the scroll. To the story that had so captivated my mother that she had thought to leave a message buried within it. It was a tale of a sage from the southernmost end of Bharat named Gautama who had been blessed by the gods with centuries of longevity and who had amassed several powerful bones with his piety besides. He had also won from the gods a prize, the beautiful bride Ahalya. Brahma had fashioned Ahalya out of water to temper the pride of the Apsaras, the dancers in Indra's heavenly court. All the gods wished to have Ahalya and so Brahma declared that the first god to complete a race against the worlds would win her hand in marriage. Indra, with his immense power, leapt into his golden chariot. His winged horses pulled him with ease around the heavens, the earth and the home of the Asuras. But when he returned, he found that Gautama was already married to Ahalya. He had walked in prayer around a cow giving birth to a calf and this was equivalent to all the worlds. Despite losing, Indra still coveted Ahalya for himself, so he bided his time. Until one day, Gautama left their home on some errand. Indra took Gautama's form and came to Ahalya and they lay together. But as the day wore on, Ahalya realized she had been tricked. She begged Indra to leave for she knew her husband's considerable wrath. It was too late, however, for as the god departed, he ran straight into Gautama. Gautama recognized immediately what had happened as he had long known Indra lusted after his wife. He cursed Indra to wear his shame on his skin, covering his visage in lewd markings. Then Indra returned to the heavens. Brahma took pity on him and turned those marks into eyes. But Gautama saved his true wrath for his wife. For he believed that she should have known the man at the door was Indra and resisted his advances. With another one of his terrible boons, he turned Ahalya to stone and left her alone in their forest home. The scroll ended there. And I knew there was no redemption for Ahalya, the the gods who would help Indra but never a woman who had slept with another man. The fault was Indra's from start to finish. Gautama could have chosen to understand and forgive her, but neither gods nor men had such mercy. I understood too why my mother, living in a cold and forbidding court and exiled by her own husband, would write her missive to me on this particular story. 
It was a warning. I took the scroll with me to my room and hid it among my things. I could not stop thinking about Ahalya, doomed to remain a stone statue in a forest, slowly eroding while her husband continued to wander the world. If a woman crafted by the gods themselves could be consigned to this fate, what hope was there for a woman born of a woman? Was that not what my mother had wished for me to know? I read the scroll enough times to commit it to memory, absorbed in thoughts as overcast as the weather. Eventually the season passed and so did my mood. Yutajit and I took advantage of the firmer ground by fighting particularly hard, beginning with spears and sparring until both our arms burned from effort. Our breaths coming short and painful. Father frets about the harvest from Shakala this year, Yutajit said as we slumped against the cool ground exhausted. Why? We have had ample rain. I plucked a stalk of long grass from the ground and shredded it as I spoke. I could not make much sense of it. He talked of blood and of the gods. But would that have what would that have to do with the harvest? I closed my eyes and envisioned a map of Kekaya. Shakala was a small farming village on the southwestern border of the kingdom near the Chandrabaga River, which was sacred to Vishnu. Something about this pricked the back of my mind. During the rainy season, we had received a rare visit from some of the rich merchants from a town upriver of Shakala. Had I learned something then? Of course, Mantara. She had told me of a strange event reported by the merchant servants as we practiced. The river had split after a torrential downpour, adding a new bend. I hadn't thought of much of it at the time, more focused on striking her shield with my sword. But now I said, Oh, oh, Yutajit asked lazily, rolling to lie in a patch of sunlight. The outlying villages all perform animal sacrifice, including Shakala, I explained. It's one of the few customs that father has allowed them to keep, even after the sages declared the practice to be barbaric and contrary to the wishes of the gods. The village would must have not realized that the new split of the Chandrabaga River runs right to them. Perhaps when they sacrificed their animals, some of the blood ran into the flooded river, offending Vishnu as the sages had warned. The color drained from Yutajit's face. I understood his fear. Vishnu was among the most powerful gods. In his immortal form, he could turn fields to ash with only a thought. But as the gods regularly answered the prayers of the pious, the gods regu- oh, sorry. So too did they often visit destruction on those who they deemed immoral. What is father to do about it then? Yutajit had only recently been allowed into Mantri Parishad. He had often told me of their discussions and we tried to find ways for him to prove himself to the others. Pray to Vishnu, I phrased my words as a question for I did not actually know the answer. Perhaps if the people of Shakala make an elaborate offering or they hold a yagna, if it would likely bankrupt the village, but that would surely appease Vishnu. Yutajit hummed thoughtfully, then threw a loose fistful of dirt on me. I suppose that meant thank you. The thick royal blue rope between us was so full and solid, it seemed nearly made of metal. I could sense my brother plain as sight. It was difficult for Yutajit to admit that I had a talent for matters of governance. To him, the throne was merely another tiresome responsibility. He knew well how to navigate the court and create spectacles, but he hated the intricacies of the court that kept the kingdom running, the ones that I navigated as easily as I did the binding plane. Yutajit liked to make fun of me for it, teasing me on how, how, ent- un- how enthusiastically I threw myself into studies of history and administration. Ashwin is falling behind, have you noticed? Yutajit interrupted my daydreaming. I pushed myself on my elbows. He had spoken quite casually, but this was not a casual matter. Falling behind? In what? Mostly in physical studies. He used to be a decent archer, but now he's merely passable and he's not progressing at all in sword play or riding. I hadn't noticed, I said dismayed. I was rarely allowed out onto the practice field where my brothers trained. And Ashim was the quietest of my brothers and least likely to complain. 
You don't have to notice everything on your own. You just sat upright so he could face me. That is why you have me. Should I talk to him? Ashwin had come down with a fever two moons ago and complained of pain so great that two servants carried him down to the deepest cellar and submerged him in the coolest bath they could draw. He had seemed to recover, but perhaps he hadn't. Not fully. I think it might be better if I speak to him. If you insist, Yutajit glanced up at the sky, noting the position of the sun. Kaikei, we should go. I collected and wrapped the spears and secured them to Yutajit's horse. Despite my protests and attempts to kick him, he lifted me up onto mine and then mounted his in an easy motion. Raise you back? he asked. That's not fair. I have to let you in. Nobody can catch me riding at such an unladylike speed. I'll race you to the top of the first hill then, he said, smiling at me. I knew that smile worked wonders on all the court ladies, but I merely rolled my eyes. What will you give me if I win? I asked. My undying love and affection? I snorted and spurred my horse. I already have that, I shouted over my shoulder as Yutajit cursed at me. My brothers adored me. But now that Yutajit had mentioned it, it occurred to me that Ashwin had not chosen to spend much time with me since his illness. I lingered by the stables, thinking I might speak to him after his riding practice, but was told he had missed it entirely. So I went instead to his rooms and found him reclined on his cot reading. What? he asked sullenly when I entered the room. Out of all my brothers, besides Yutajit, Ashwin usually looked the most like me. But his small nose and tapered chin had become sunken over the past few months, giving him a sickly appearance that his shoulder-length curtain of black hair could not hide. Ashwin acted nothing like how I would have behaved had I had the privilege of being a boy. But then again, most boys knew nothing of their incredible luck. Instead of immersing himself in his weapons, training or speaking his mind when invited to his father's, he always tried to shrink into the shadows and avoided the outdoors and the training fields whenever he could. How are your riding lessons going? I kept my voice deliberately light and didn't look at him. Instead moving to the paper window, he would wilt under too much attention. Fine. And your sword play? How is it progressing? Fine. That's not what I've heard, I said gently, lowering myself to the edge of the bed. He shrunk away from me ever so slightly. I think I'll be dismissing your instructor. Clearly he's not doing a good job. No, Ashwin protested, showing more emotion than he had for our whole conversation. I hid a smile. No, we cannot have you falling behind. It's not his fault, Ashwin whispered, almost to himself. I stayed silent, waiting, and... I can't do it. Do what? I asked. He hung his head and I clenched my fingers to stop myself from stroking his hair. It would only embarrass him. Instead, I found our bond, a strong white sinew, and sent him a lightest of suggestions. Tell me. Ashwin sighed. Ride or hold a sword properly. My elbows and my knees, he stopped. Take your time, I said. Ashwin shifted slightly. They hurt. Ever since I got sick, they hurt all the time and even more when I'm in the practice yard. I see. At last, I turned towards Ashwin. Why didn't you tell me? I thought it would get better, he said. The admission clearly bothered him. What's wrong with me? I don't know. To Ashwin, false wars were worse than worrisome truths. He hated the usual childhood promise that everything will be fine. But I will speak to the healers. There is a side effect of some of the worst fevers. You are not alone. I think they have herbs and exercises that have helped others. They can help you. No, he said instantly. No, I asked. They can ease your pain. I don't want anyone else to know. Besides, I hate training. I hate warfare and anything to do with it. Please, Didi, don't tell them, he begged. Didi simply meant elder sister, but even though he had used it as a term of term of endearment to manipulate me, the words still filled me with warmth. The white cord between us thrummed. Have you always hated it? I asked. Or is it because of this pain? 
Don't act like I'm stupid, he said, turning away from me. Okay, I relented. You really hate it. You can't abandon it altogether. But perhaps we can tell people you've taken an interest in healing and wish to pursue that. It's an important profession and as the fourth born, you would be allowed that path. Ashwin's eyes widened. I never thought of that. You're 11. I'm 16, I reminded him. And I finally gave in the urge to ruffle his hair. He squirmed away from me, but I did not care, pleased with myself and my solution. Besides, that's why I'm here. When I received the summons to my father's private rooms, I assumed it was to discuss Ashwin's new placement. I silently rehearsed my reasons for the decision as I navigated the halls and mentally prepared myself to try to use the thin, slippery string between us to bring him around. But when I pushed open the door, ready for the battle, I stopped short in surprise. My father and Yutajit were seated together at a small table, papers fanned out before them. The high window and the squat, flickering lamps placed in the wall niches did nothing to ease the coldness emanating from the room. Kaikei, Yutajit said, smiling at me. It did not reach his eyes. Dread pooled in my belly. The blue cord that connected Yutajit and me in the binding plane vibrated a warning, and I imagined I could feel the thrum extend into my heart sending a jolt through my limbs. Ah, Kai Kei, thank you for joining us. My father did not sound grateful at all and did not lift his gaze from the letters in front of him. Have a seat. I obeyed, perching on a low wooden stool. My father's spare style did not even extend to his own comfort, although he did use a small footrest. When it became apparent he would not immediately speak, I drew a letter towards me. It was a flowery missive extolling the virtues of some chieftain's son. My stomach flipped in awful anticipation as I read about a young man's skill in hunting and his fairness when adjudicating disputes among the clan. And there it was, right at the end. The honour of your daughter's hand. Panic shot through me. I shoved the missive away from me. Only Yutajit's quick reflexes stopped it from flying off the table. Stay calm, he mouthed. I took a deep breath to shake, to keep myself from leaning across the table and shaking him. Calm, father had summoned me here for to discuss marriage. Although I knew in a removed way that I would one day be wed, I could not believe it was happening now. Was I supposed to be eager for this? I felt no desire to take a man as a husband, to share a bed or a life with him. I had always assumed that I had more time to prepare myself, that it would come later, when I was older. As I was reading my thoughts, my father said, You're already 16 and it's time to speak of your marriage, Kaikei. He finally lifted his head to look at me. I should have arranged it years ago, but but I thought your brothers needed you here in your mother's place. They still need me, I protested. My voice sounded high, girlish. I just helped Ashwin with... But now I've realized your influence is making them soft, he interrupted coldly. And we cannot postpone the matter of your marriage any longer. Our kingdom needs to make new alliances. Please, I began, but Yutajit jerked his head at me and I swallowed my words. Instead, I plucked at the fragile thread between me and my father. I did not apply too much pressure for fear it would break. Even though a large part of me wanted to cut our bond straight in two. You bear the name of our kingdom, my father said. He seemed to soften as the thread between us quivered under my influence. You are the first of your name and it is your duty to represent Kekaya. We are struggling. We need alliances and you cannot stay here forever. I bowed my head. I knew what small scraps he gave me were poor attempts at manipulation. He did not even care enough to put real effort into it. Those pretty words about fuss and duty were only there to make me compliant. When I stayed silent, he sighed. These are the proposals we've received so far. Once we make it publicly known that you're ready, more will arrive. I want a swayamvara, I said immediately, then clapped a hand over my mouth. I had interrupted my father for all my newfound sense of self-worth. I was still his daughter. I had broken every rule of decorum and protocol. Anger clouded my father's features. Don't you? It's a good idea, Yutajit said hastily. Gratitude flooded through me. I could rely on him blindly, even without going into the blind binding plane. A swayamra will bring attention to Kekaya. 
such a contest for a woman's hand is only hosted by great kingdoms and he can secure our place among them and kekaya and kaikeyi will be able to pick a match among the best contestants so she will not have to marry a man she has never met everyone will be happy i prayed for the possibility however remote that our father's love for yutajit might distract him from his anger convince him of this plan <clears throat> yutajit's hands were clasped knuckles turning white i realized he was praying too the gods never listened to me but perhaps they would bend for my brother my father stared at yutajit for a long minute and i held myself as still as possible hoping to escape attention finally raja ashwapati nodded you make intelligent points yutajit you have a fine head on your shoulders thank you father yutajit said my father flapped a hand towards me and i rose thus dismissed from the preparations of for my own engagement yutajit said little leading us out past the hilly fields and into the cool forest unlike the densely wooded land south of kekaya the growth here was sparse and the brush presented little obstacle there was no large game to be found among the trees so hardly anyone ventured here the only sound for the thin cries of birds for the first time i wondered what it was they were saying i went to remove the weapons from his saddle bag but he shook his head come sit he said i sat beside him on a slightly damp earth leaning against rough bark and drawing my knees close to my chest yutajit was silent which was unusual just when i entered the plane intending to suggest that he speak he gave a small sigh it will be a contest of strength yutajit told me turning so that his shoulder was against the trunk and he was facing me i groaned at his admission but in truth i had ex- not expected any less cleverness or charity were not much prized in a kingdom such as ours besides while a swayamvara supposedly allowed a bride to pick among her suitors after they showed their skills in reality the bride's father always made clear which options were truly suitable but it was still better than having no choice at all how long do i have one year don't jest i said how bad is it really a moon a fortnight be honest and being honest i convinced him that one year was the best option that it would give us time to arrange a truly spectacular contest and ensure that the most powerful princess accepted an invitation the young prince of gandhara will definitely come they have been seeking an alliance with us for some time the kambojas should send a delegation even koshala might come yutaji took my hand traced the lines of my palm with a finger as young children we had pretended to be soothsayers reading each other's palms and mapping ludicrous futures In hindsight the stories he created were nowhere near absurd enough to describe the catastrophe of my life but I had no way of knowing it then a year i breathed i breathed nearly unable to comprehend the words the litany of kingdoms all powerful and important allies did not excite me nearly as much as a gift that was time and a choice or at least more than what you would have had yudajit said my heart surged and i tackled him into the dirt embracing him Thank you thank you thank you you are my favorite brother obviously yutajit scoffed who else would it be shantanu ashwin i said rolling off to lie next to him ashwin is next of course our strangest brother and who's your favorite brother i guessed mohan you are my favorite he said sitting up and brushing himself off i remained on the ground content i'm not your brother you wrestle in the dirt you like weapons and fast horses you're smart you that just listed off i'd say you're more man than woman i rolled my eyes that's idiotic women can be all those things intelligence doesn't make me less of a woman and i would think that you knew that the contentment faded his words hurt more than i could tell him don't take offense you that just said it's a compliment who wants to be a woman the words were callous a careless joke he was my brother my twin and i thought at the very least he believed me his equal I had fooled myself into thinking I could be an exception an intelligent woman in control of her own destiny that he saw me that way but now I was to be married off and he would be a king for now I was still his twin I took his hand when he offered it letting him haul me up from the dirt and we walked with and walked with him shoulder to shoulder to our horses